Farnaz Fatami is an Iranian American poet, editor, and writing teacher in Santa Cruz, California. Her debut book, Sister Tongue, won the 2021 Stan and Tongwick Poetry Prize, selected by Casey Trey Smith, and is forthcoming from Kent State University Press. Cynthia Parker Ohene is a three time Pushcart nominee, abolitionist, cultural worker, and therapist. She is an MFA graduate in creative writing at St. Mary's College of California and the Chester Aaron Scholar for Excellence in Creative Writing. Her book, Daughters of Harriet, was published in March 2022. And finally, Leonora Simonovis is the author of Study of the Raft, winner of the 2021 Colorado Prize for Poetry. Her work has appeared in Gargoyle, Quelly Journal, Diode Poetry Journal, Tinderbox Poetry Journal, and The Rumpus, among others. And she has been the recipient of fellowships from the Women Who Submit, BONA, and the Poetry Foundation. So thank you, all of you. And I am going to turn it over to you, Leonora. Thank you, Elizabeth. Can you hear me OK? Yes. OK, perfect. Um, I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're very, very thankful and honored and privileged to be here. We want to thank Elizabeth and Brooke and Anna and Patrick for all the work they've done to publicize our workshop and also to help us with connectivity and all of these things. And thank you everyone who's here today. We really appreciate you taking the time to, to come and share some time with us and, um, and to listen to some poems and do some writing and take care of yourself that way. So um, I wanna begin by just giving a little intro to our workshop. Um, we are three writers from different backgrounds and our works intersect and are in conversation with one another. And they engage with the ways in which history has shaped our identities and the identities of the communities that we belong to, as well as how language is both a tool and a weapon, particularly in relation to politics and the marginalization of women. Like Emily Dickinson before us, we challenge and question the boundaries, constraints, and societal expectations that keep us from telling our truths and our stories. The themes we have identified in our panel continue to influence our work as creative artists and storytellers who understand the importance of language as a means of expression and also of interacting with the world around us. So the way this panel is going to work is that we have divided it into three sections and it, each section has a couple of themes. Each of us is going to lead one of the sections where we're going to talk a little bit about the themes, read a poem each, and then have a short conversation. At the end of the third panel, we'll have a short Q&A session. And after that, we'll have a writing session. Um, we'll, um, we have some prompts for you that um, Elizabeth will distribute. And then um, if we have the time, hopefully we do, they will, there will be some optional sharing. So the first section is language and history. So languages have a history of their own. They change over time as inevitably people and their environment also change. And as borders become permeable, allowing for the constant flow of migration, which creates unique exchanges, negotiations, and interactions among people of different origins and cultures. This results in the adoption of new words, new perspectives, and in the reframing of cultural dynamics. Language builds, but also displaces. It creates, defines, constrains, and opens up worldviews. It's not just a tool or a technology. It is also an embodied practice that grants us the privilege of connecting to the world around us, to understand and make sense of it, and to communicate with our fellow humans. Language locates us within space and time. It names our joys and fears our silences. Language is history, for without it, history would not exist as we know it today. History, on the other hand, relies on the power of language to exist both as discipline and as memory. 
In Spanish, history and story are spelled in the same exact way, historia. Twin words, two sides of the same coin. Our stories are an important part of history and poems can be a way to tell those stories, to speak about and within the silences. So I'm going to read um, a poem titled Katsarida Fobia, which means fear of cockroaches. Katsarida Fobia. It wasn't so much the smell of rancid oil, but how they starred the ceiling, many-legged nightmares falling on our beds. If I paid attention, I could see their constellations shifting. I call them Azabache, Canela, Luna, Lucero, like the horses we rode at the farm. Tame, familiar. Mama scolded me for not killing them, but the sound of death is not meant for every ear. How many times did I panic when wings smacked my body, when legs skittered on an arm or leg? The only time I stepped on a roach, the scene repeated in my head like a horror film. I kept looking at the corpse, unnerved by postmortem spasms. It's easier to run, brush the fear away, but maybe I should have asked them, what is my name? And um, I want to ask Farnas to read her poem on translated. And then Cynthia, after that, can you read Act So There Is No Use in a Center? Thank you, Leonora. It's great to be here. And again, this section is about language and history. And um, this, the, so much of the book, my book, Sister Tongue, is about what it means to reckon with the inheritance of language, of political context, of culture, and what it means to refuse some of the limits that are given us, the sort of options that are supposedly set uh, for us um, as, as women, as writers, as humans. And so this poem that I'm going to read is the second one in the book, and it begins to ask the question that's central to the book is what can be gained by an openness to a multiplicity of selves. It's called Untranslated. In the silence of my girlhood, spoons clattered in glasses of tea the squeak of the front door closing. I was the child I'd never have. I listened for clues. I spoke without saying a thing. I made sounds to fill the spaces I could see around everyone. My teeth and eyes gleamed, face open, a flower. As if to say to these people, speak say things I understand. Their untranslated words whoosh by an autumn gust, staticky din of English and Farsi with afternoon fruit and cookies, my lips mouthing along with them to pay attention as I wrote their stories in my head, rearranged the letters into meaning. I heard the squished sounds of a heartbeat and a stethoscope, pump and thrum. In the languages of women I could have been, I felt both lonely and contained. We were chadorless, light-skinned. All the women who disappeared into the silence inside me, I pull from the roar of the past. I make introductions, by which I mean, I want the foreigner in me to meet the foreigner in me. Thank you, Farnas. Cynthia, would you read your poem? Yes, I'm going to read, Act So There Is No Use in a Center. And when I talk about language, throughout, I'm talking about um, liberation, using language for liberation and revolt, um, using language as culture, and those of us whose 
initial language was not English, but that we speak a colon, um, the language of the colonizer. Act so there is no use in a center. Words like Negroes must be in season, not too dark. Kin to a white cousin like Monet's water lilies. Black is politic. It casts too many shadows trying to be adjacent to the sun. Black words like a black dog may foam or fang or penetrate. Cut their straps from boots and strangle the language. Thank you, Cynthia. That's beautiful. So um, the other day I was listening to a podcast where the poet Jake Skeets, he's a Diné poet, um, was talking about how we understand the universe through language, but we also speak the language of the colonizer and have been influenced by those narratives. So um, Farnas, in your poem, language is traveling through time to interrogate your experiences in the world and how I am fascinated by how sound and silence are cohabiting in the same <clears throat> space on the page and then how language becomes something that goes beyond the spoken word mm -hmm. and um, for you Cynthia the I love how in all of your poems but particularly in this poem um, the language of the colonizer is constantly challenged because of its capacity to label to displace to discriminate so I was wondering um, if you can both talk about the process of writing these poems in terms of how language plays a role in offering both a particular worldview, but also in renaming and recreating a world in which the speaker can be a part of the collective official history. Yes. Shall I go first? <laughs> I'll jump in. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah um, I I grew up in a household. I want to say, that, you know, this is very important to this poem that that I heard both English and Farsi, but was not necessarily expected to be understanding the Farsi. And I'm sure that I'm not alone. I'm I know that that that's such a common both immigrant and immigrant child child um, experience to have that that sense of language. And I grew up as someone who felt very disconnected from my own language, from my own ability to speak. Um, I felt alien to, to words. Um, and I think that has a lot to do with that experience, uh, what, what it was like to be in that, you know, surrounded by, by um, a beautiful language that I, that I didn't know I knew. Um, and I think the, it's, it's an, the poem was really important to try to to grapple with. I when I wrote it, it was late in the writing of the rest of the poems in the book, and I needed something to sort of explain to myself what I was doing, <laughs> like what was I thinking what, about. And really, it is about the way um, silence has given me another space of language, and it's really hard to it's really hard to talk about, um, but it's a very important place um for me that 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 space where I became who I am um but I was able to 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 finally I mean it, it took a long time but to try to choose what it meant to speak um to 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 make choices about the language I use to make choices about learning Farsi as a as a, a later in life um, to be able to say I moved back and forth, but never fluently in either. Um, and just to embrace that and to sort of accept that and to have power from that. Um, so in in the way that I've I'm now part of my own retail, my own stories, I'm telling my own history. I I don't know what that means in terms of the, the second part of your question about recreating my place in the collective history, but I think it's an important move for everyone um, to be able to do something like that. I'll stop. I want to hear what Cynthia has to say. To yeah, you. definitely. <laughs> so there's a quote that I, I found by Sadia Hartman that says that 
um, it's about giving the words of a slave the same weight as Foucault. And that's what, that's what I live by, that I take the words and I rearrange them, I, I end them, I, I use them as weapons to disturb the comfortable and provide comfort to the discomfortable. So um, I too have that background. I think of silences when we talk about language because that, I mean, when you silence the people, then their language becomes unimportant. You don't get to really express who you are authentically. Um, but my goal in EXO, There Is No Use in a Center, is to talk about that um, using, using language as a, a Black woman is not, no, no one cares about what a Black woman thinks about or feels. And we see this every day in the country, so that when we are vocal, the, the move is to, to silence us or to diminish us in some sort of way. I think that um, making sure that I'm visible through poetry, making sure there's a record, that's how I see it as the as the um, being a part of the official or collective history to talk about the collective in terms of um, how black people live and feel in this country. And so once these words are recorded, um, then folks will know. I think about who my descendants are gonna be and I want them to know how I lived, where I lived and what my history or what our history is. And so um, Toni Morrison um, talks about that a lot, that um, reclaiming, reclaiming history is, is the present. And we, we must reclaim it because we will lose the cultural memory of our, of our culture. And, and I'm not interested in assimilating, I'm interested in being aware where I come from, who I am. And, and so I use language um, to do that. That's so beautiful. Absolutely, I agree. I mean, and the idea of our words serving as an archive for our truths and the truths of our people, our ancestors, um, I believe in that. Like, even if people say, I don't read poetry, the words are out there. Someone's going to read them and they're going to impact someone as well. Um, I know that in my, in my book and particularly in this poem, I, I'm talking about fear and it's a book where I talk about the consequences of colonization and what it has done to our people, what we have lost. Um, and one of the things that, um, that I talk about in terms of fear is the fear of um, being harmed by another. And in, in my case, you know, it was the government and, um, and having to leave my homeland. And so, you know, I talk about the cockroaches, but the cockroaches are a metaphor for something else, right? Um, and so how do you name your fears and why? And what does that mean? And, and for me, that means speaking up and in naming them, I am also making them visible for me, but for others as well. Um, and so I can, I can relate to what both of you have said, you know, in terms of the silences, but also in terms of using language to, to re-enact your own truth so that it is, um, it, it becomes an archive of the collective communities that we belong to. So um, we are out of time for this part of the panel, but I, sorry, that's my timer. Um, I'd like to pass the baton to Farnas, who's going to guide us in the next section of the panel. Yes, thank you. Um, and 
as as um, Elizabeth said, there's we're not using the chat function or not using the raise hands feature right now, but we are hoping that people will have some questions and there's a there's time after the three panels for questions and answers um, and more conversation. Um, so I, I you know we've divided this into three themes three or three sections with six themes and it's sort of an artificial division because we know that all six of these themes that we've focused on really speak across to each other they speak clearly to each other and they're so related so um, this is this section is about gender and patriarchy but um but obviously it's it's there's so much about language as well um as i consider all three of our books together i i think they're as as words, as work, a testament to the way that even when women don't survive the forces of patriarchy, um, their memory does. And this memory can inform the way their legacies find agency and power, and hopefully through our words. Um, each book, Study of the Raft, Sister Tongue, and Daughters of Harriet, is strengthened by a reshaping of language against patriarchy. And retelling women's stories towards that wholeness of a story is resistance to patriarchy. And I think each of the next three poems you'll hear reflects that in their own way. Um, so I'm going to start with my poem, and then we'll hear one from Cynthia, um, The History of Gynecology, and from Leo Kudafoli, number one. So this is T. And um, the poem pretends to be a list of definitions in a dictionary. So that might be useful to know as you listen, just in terms of form. T, a widely cultivated shrub of the family Theaceae, a reception, snack, or meal at which tea is served. The drink made by steeping leaves of the tea plant in water heated over a flame. From the 1980s on, definitively not chai, the spiced sweetened Indian drink with added milk. In Farsi, chai. Served in glasses to cup in your palm, though traditional glasses have metal holders for protection where daughters listen to what's important in a life, where women complain through the sugar cube they're holding in their teeth and smile when they notice they're crying, where what's really being drunk is attention. Space of not ritual. I learned that there aren't really rules for tea. I like the noisiest women best. I perform what I know of hierarchy, of who serves whom, and think, I'll never have daughters who serve me tea, relieved there's a place for me here. To serve the tea and behave, to look like I know what that means. Bitter amber drink to wash down sorrow and fear. Tannic tonic, homeroom, safe word. Whisper chai when they ask you what you want. It's never greedy. Synonym, respite, memory, name among women. Cynthia, would you now read for, for us your poem, The History of Gynecology? Yes. Um, first, before I read the history of gynecology, I would like to say that this may that this is a poem that may be hard for you to hear. It details the gruesome operations by James Marion Sims, known as the father of modern gynecology. So take care of yourself and do what is best for you. The history of gynecology. The enslavers cage the black girls first. They lop off the braiding and fingernails, which they place in a clamped gunny sack with oddments, nettings, 
peeled eyes, Negro repellent, disintegrated limbs, and assorted mason jars teeming with enslaved menstrual blood and scraped labia wounds for surveillance. Dr. Sims slashes the whistling gorges in the experiments he loved, the way a hottentot scorches in a frankincense of fistulas draping the operating table. Only savage black girls possess the hottentot. These savage black girls buckle under the top of dismemberment, an unbraiding of the feminine, the braiding, Dr. Sims thought, Baroque and aboriginal Jew, Jew, the elongated tufts from the black savage girls pre on hot and tot, now fur pelts, dress the shoulders of his waltzing wife on alpine nights, while black girls, these savage black girls, Lucy, Annika, and Betsy, who possessed a mold, an ethereal hot and tot, prepared mistresses hibiscus tea and tea cakes. However, Mistress Sims wanted something more. She inquired about these savage black girls, hottentots, about the incense of the hottentots. She wanted to rub it across her vagina to entice a woman. Mistress Sims craved the smell of the hottentot and African primrose, the black savage girls possessed. Such black savage girls, Lucy 17, Annika and Betsy both 18, did not avow pain because they lived through the fear of an ensnared a fetal skull gashed in the birth canal along with insertions of ten speculums. If savage black girls felt the terrorism of bloodletting, it was not known to them. The surgical apartheid covens continue to peel back each bark of black skin, an antebellum monogram whittled into a napalm world. Their imperialized hottentots on impression tables as a storehouse, a balm for white women among lawn, lacy, sawn, and Portland stone. This under the cedar cladding on the land side of percolation ponds, canted bays, crossing coves, and arched lunettes held by Doric piers with the burnt smell of hottentot and ya. Poem takes my breath away. Thank you, Cynthia, for that. Leo, we'll move to your poem, Kuda Foli. So this poem was inspired by Leonora Carrington's uh, Down Below, which is where she details her internment into a sanatorium in Spain um, and the way she was treated by the doctors and how she was put on medication and tied up and all that. Coup de Folie one, after Leonora Carrington. White coats skulk behind me. I long to ride Pegasus, but he cannot cross the threshold of Cardiosol. Unlike the Gorgon, I cannot turn contempt into bread and stone. The coats form a triangle. Take me with them. I want a version of myself that will break the cords, binding my mane and tail to a bed, where Perseus places a mirror in front of me, then breaks it. Oh no, I lost Leo, did other people? Yeah, yeah, she's frozen. She was, she'll be back, we know she will. 
Oh, did we lose her? We lost her completely. I know she'll come back. She was having some connectivity issues. She's still on the call. She's just not spotlighted. When she comes oh, back, we'll spotlight her again. Oh, okay. She's still on. Um, yeah, there she is. I'm gonna. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> I'm having okay. connectivity issues. Do you want to? Do you, you? Are you there now? Can you? Hear yeah, yeah, I'm here. I'm Great. Here. Yeah. You'd gotten. You hadn't quite gotten to the end when we lost you. No, um, I was almost at the end. This is yes. like a cliffhanger. Perseus and placing yeah. her. You can go yes. back to Perseus. Perseus places a mirror in front of me, then breaks it. He doesn't understand. I worship myself because I see myself complete. Thank you. Thank, thank you. That, sorry, we, sorry, your poem got interrupted. It's so powerful. And because I see myself complete, it's just such a fabulous ending for what we're talking <laughs> about. Um, I, so when we're talking about all three of these poems, I really am thinking about how when, when women are silent or and especially when women are silenced the forces of patriarchy win and um each of these poems i think are acts of resistance to those forces in the way that they shape a new story um to which comes from agency or strength and what i'm seeing as new story is the reclaiming of forgotten history and in the choices to tell the story in a specific way in the urgent and necessary shift in perspectives away from a male-centered eye. So each of these poems is very different from the others and each has a very distinct and I think well-crafted voice. And I wonder if each of you would be willing to talk about the voice or voices in the poem um, and what, that, what does that term mean for you in this your particular poem? And how did you find that, that voice and, and craft it or revise it? maybe what were some of the things you were really conscious of in terms of not only who is speaking, but who, for whom and to whom in each of your poems. Cynthia, do you want to begin? Yeah, I'll go. Um, so in, in thinking about this, I thought about because the women that I'm writing about were enslaved women, of course, they didn't have a voice. However, I feel I'm the um, amanuensis um, for them. So I'm speaking in their voice, uh, hopefully getting across that history that has been hidden so that folks will know exactly how gynecology came to be in America. And the fact that uh, black women were used to breed so and which it was the sort is the source of wealth so that is how america became the wealthiest nation in the world through slavery and the breeding of of slaves um and also i wanted to talk about how uh james marion sims wrote a book talking for uh betsy annika and um lucy by saying that um they volunteered and were willing to be uh, the lab rats for uh, these experiments, which is um, absolutely insane. Um, and also that um, enslaved women could handle this type of pain because white ladies couldn't. And so when you go to the gynecologist and you see the speculum, think of uh, Lucy Annika and Betsy. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna keep my camera off so that I don't get disconnected. Apologies for that. Um, I do find some similarities um, between my poem and Cynthia's because um, this poem actually has two parts. And the second part, um, I write about my aunt who suffered from mental illness um, and was hospitalized at a young age and has remained there for the rest of her life. And so um, the way in which uh, Leonora Carrington describes this um, stay in the sanatorium 
is quite disturbing and it does remind me of a lot of the issues that are coming up with healthcare in particular um, in regards to not just women but also members of the LGBTQI communities um, and how their issues are disregarded um, and also misunderstood um, sometimes on purpose sometimes not but um in this particular poem, I was thinking about two things. Um, one was the idea of women as mad, especially when they speak up and they try to assert their rights and um, say what they want. And especially when they talk about desire. And two, um, how those women are able to express themselves in um, literature and how many of those uh, works were considered minor or subgenres rather than you know something bigger um, that was a part of the canonical literature. So um, when I was writing that poem I was really thinking I was first of all thinking about my aunt but I was also thinking about all the women who have had to fight to be able to write to be able to do what they want to be able to be heard to be able to be taken care of um and i think that you know all of our poems sort of intersect that way in our conversation with each other in that regard right when you finished my timer went off um <laughs> thank you both for those uh, both powerful poems and thoughtful comments about them. And hopefully we'll continue to talk later about more of these issues. I'm, I'm going to pass the, um, the baton to Cynthia to lead us in our final section on family and migration. Okay. Our poems explore family and migration, histories tied to exile and enslavement, with roots geopolitically and sociohistorically intertwined with language that challenges directly the intersections of multi-oppressions. Multi These poems are not constrained by Eurocentric thought. The politics of displacement offers instead the dialectics of diasporic identities Language describes women of color with a differential gaze. Language in these poems have repossessed race, gendered and class, migratory and language patterns. The construction of identity and the cultural repertoire of these social behaviors are echoed through pattern language. So I'm, I'm going to, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so we're going to start with Farnaz's poem first, and then, um, no, I'm sorry. We're going to start with Leo at the airport, then Farnaz, and then Lisa. Sorry. Okay. So uh, this is at the airport. The young woman stands like an unmoored sentence, red-rimmed eyes roaming the crowds. Next to her, a young man, her boyfriend and her mother. He lifts his hand as if wanting to touch the parts of her he wants to remember, but the woman has already turned the page. Sometimes, the only way out is to step into the fable of another existence. Every few minutes, a flash of military green, raised voices, another passenger detained and hassled for a few dollars. Things to remember, you are a one-way ticket, say goodbye, not hasta luego. To leave is to tune into your own unraveling, to understand that forever is also never. The woman holds her loved ones, stands up, wobbles, straightens. Call us when you get to the gate, the mother says. Sh 
Shall I go? I think, I think so. so. <laughs> okay. Um, I love that poem, Leo. Um, this is this is Farnaz. It's a long poem in three parts. Farnaz, one. Our parents argued in a language we didn't understand. We were born in Las Vegas or Tehran, twin cities of fantasy and chance. My sister and I found our words in Long Beach, big wheels and Barbies, bluebird troops and kidnap breakfasts. A war forced our cousins to buy false passports, lose their savings. We ate Chef Boyardee after school, hot spinach and meatball soup on the weekends. I yelled into a phone so my Iranian family could hear me. I learned I was the silk carpet my mother didn't own, the casino payout my father kept chasing. I didn't know until later the Persian leopard was trapped in the Zagros Mountains after the Iran-Iraq war in danger of tripping old mines. Two. I taught myself who I was by watching my sister carefully. I worried when the day came and I wanted to say, I'm not her. First out the womb, she was named and I wasn't. Her name is Iranian, but sayable by everyone. My name would wait. They waited until they knew they had it right. Not Sheila, my mother's veto. Farnaz, a name that made me lonely. We lived in between Iran and America, a customs declaration zone. By the time I was born, my mute parents wondered how to speak as Americans as they moved away from the people who loved them. How could I know the dark inside their mouths hurt them too. Three, my father studied numbers in the racing forms and I bet following my gut. I influenced dice at the craps table by spinning three times in each direction while my father placed his bets. Even now, I'll retell stories in my head 100 times to end them right. It's a system. I came from the racetrack, ignoring all the horses in the flesh. I sounded out the names of long shots. The odds say blinding telegram will win, but I like the music of Queen the Fox. I believed that how I got my name would mean something. I am still finding the names for some things, the youth my parents brought to parenting, the attention I didn't know I was waiting for, the word for wanting, feeling its deep hole. Such naming I have been slow to do. I am waiting until I have it right. I know that once named, there is a road down which that named thing runs, and I am not the one who built the road. Yeah, I really think I'm going to tie together nicely. I'm going to read Greyhound Bus Station, 1950. B, the gift shop sales clerk, wore the scent of Virginia on her feet. She walked hard like farmhands do, but she was beginning to understand northern habituals, going to beauty shops, buying greens at food barn, dropping her aras. But Jim Crow wouldn't leave her alone. He kept showing up when she tried on sassy chartreuse hats with nine-inch feathers, bowed around the brim for Wednesday, five o'clock service at Enon Baptist Church. Lucky Brown, Cosmetics, reddish Savoy pumps at Florines, 
The May Company's policy did not allow grease stains on the merchandise, so she stepped over the sapphire's brims, we crown colored heads. At the station, she left the change for white customers on the counter, black skin beaches. Yet her pride was in the display. Travels with white aunts, see New York City on a dollar a day. But she knew her station. Arrived here at 19 to attend a colored school for colored women. The station master felt a colored sales clerk would better serve their customers as a domestic in the back, like her ride up south. So I would like to pose this question for our discussion. What is, are the expectations of the new land and what aspect is fulfilled, has fulfilled your individual or family expectations? How is migration situated historically in your family and how does, did it affect folks left behind? I can, um, I can start. So um, when I wrote at the airport, I actually wanted to write about my experience leaving my homeland. And um, for those of you who don't know, I'm an exile, so I don't get to return. I don't have a home to return to. So um, it was very difficult. It was very painful trying to write about that. And finally, someone gave me a prompt and they said, you know, think about looking at it through the lens of a camera and just zoom in. What do you see? And so um, most of my family lives outside of uh, Venezuela, um, especially my generation. But those who are left behind are the elders um, because they can't leave, because they don't want to, um, because they would have to start over. And that's very hard when you're in your 60s or your 70s. Um, so what what happens is that there's sort of a disconnect between us as time goes by. You know, sometimes they are talking about um, places or people that I used to know and I have begun to forgotten, um, to forget, I'm sorry. And, um, and so that actually also begins to shift my own identity and my way of looking at myself, of seeing myself in this new land um, and in my relationship to language, to my um, both my native language, which is Spanish, and to my second language, which is English. And I think um, for me, it's actually beautiful how both languages cohabit with, with each other, how they negotiate with each other, how there are things that I can't say in one, but I can say in the other. Um, and which is why in my poems, I have a little bit of both. Um, I, I will speak just briefly. Uh, the, I, I think the, the questions of place and, and movement and migration are, are central to so many of the poems in, in my book, but, um, but really it's part of what, what, What's true is that my family, um, all, through my extended family, which is my family, um, came left Iran for many different reasons, and some of them didn't leave, and so um, and they left at different po- points in time. My my parents, um, my father came to the United States on a scholarship to study college, and he was supposed to go back to Iran, and he just chose not to, and should have. He was supposed to pay pay the government back by going back and. Um, but he has not been back since. And but but I was um, raised with so many connections to my family and to to the country that it it became um, a sort of like lifetime question of what what it means to be um, to move, what it means to to stay connected to uh, um, the past, um, how to bring the past into the present. I mean, 
time travel is is um is so much a part of writing and is so much part of I think uh, the the uh, many of the poems we've all shared um is crossing distances um through language um but I I I I do think I do that partly for myself but I also feel like I'm sort of compelled to do that for family members who who've chosen not to go back to the to Iran for their own really good reasons and I I chose to go to put you know, put feet on the ground as as a grown woman, um, for all kinds of reasons. I think um, that now it's, and then there's a whole, you know, another complex layer to this is that many people couldn't leave or chose to stay in Iran, um, and and now Iran is a, an entirely different country from the one they were born into, um, and so that that movement is a it's a it's a whole nother layer um it's not my experience but it's my loved one's experience so I try to know it and speak into it um I'm aware of time so I'm not going to say more but thank you Cynthia for that really good great question thanks um <clears throat> excuse me so I looked at I looked at this question in a two-pronged way one, because um, Black people in this country um, came on the slave ships, like forced migration. And then the poem about my mother is about the Great Migration from 1910 to 1970, where six million Black folks in the South left and went north to the Midwest and to the West, trying to uh, seek um, a life without subjugation. And so in the poem, as I talk about, my mother worked in the Greyhound bus station, but it didn't last because the customers did not want her at the front counter. They wanted her, why can't she work in the back cleaning? Why is she, um, why are we purchasing tickets there? And so the reason for the migration to the North is the same it's similar to the migration of, of both of you. And it's that we want for our families what everybody else wants for their families. We want a better life. Uh, my parents uh, met um, in their new town that they left. My father was forced to leave um, because he was 16, helping my grandfather to share crop in North Carolina. And he wanted, a, he wanted a different type of life. He felt like, well, this is still slavery as a sharecropper and went north where he met my mother. And so my, my father did not even go back south until he was in his 40s because he has such hatred and animosity of the way that he grew up. And so, um, this whole pattern of, of migration, the great migration was important because black people say we can't, we're not going to stay on our knees. So we need to move somewhere else. And as I said in the poem, however, Jim Crow still went, still followed them. So, um, so now I, it's the issue of, we know that Jim Crow um, white supremacy is systemic. So wherever you go in the country, you're going to be facing uh, those um, same issues. And, and also that when I think of my ancestors and my parents who are now ancestors, I was their wildest imagination as they say in black culture. I was the wildest imagination because I went to school, I did what they wanted to do. And so I, it's important for me to document that. And I would like to end the discussion by saying that in, in um, Leo's poem at the airport, this really struck me when Leo said, sometimes the only way out is to step into the fable of another existence. And, the, and, 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 and to me, that, that's, that's really what it's about. And then in Farnes's poem, um, self-titled Farnes, I know that once named, there is a road down 
which that named thing runs, and I am not the one who built it. Thanks. Thank you, Cynthia and Parnas. This was beautiful. Um, and just like, I'm just like letting your words, <laughs> your words bathe me um, as I also think about, you know, how they connect, but how we process all of this. Um, so we have about five minutes uh, for a short Q&A. So if anyone has any questions, uh, Elizabeth, were you having them put the questions in the Q&A box? I've sent a few reminders and I think we can give people a few minutes. If you scroll up, there was one question um, that was pasted in the chat. I might not be able to see it because I got disconnected. So I lost part of the chat. So if anyone right, can I'll see it. <laughs> I'll repaste it. Yeah, okay. someone else has done that. Oh. So are we looking at Scott's com question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to that. Um, certainly, yes, language involving gender is undergoing many changes. Language is going under undergoing many changes, but it's important the what the the way that the language involving gender has flexed and is continuing to flex. And I think I think you you're saying it. It's it is a very important place for um people to have agency um and and i i mean i think that's what makes us the three of us at least and any of you poets <laughs> um because because there's power in um in that both in uh both in just understanding what we uh, are seeing and um and and finding in the world but also in transforming the world so the way I think that's the same way that that the they that the singular pronouns um, the pr plural pronouns um, are are intertwining um, is is how is is it's about reclaiming power. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to that. There's other questions coming too. Yeah, I I agree with that, and also um, in speaking about Spanish, for example, which is a very gendered language. Um, those changes are coming slowly but surely. And um, I do teach courses in Spanish and I, you know, we're always um, trying to teach our students what these changes are and how to use the pronouns. There are students who um, end up using either he or she because they don't know what they is in Spanish. It's a little different from how it usually would be spelled. Um, so, so I am hopeful for the new generations because they do have not just the curiosity, but also the will to make those changes. They want them. And, and I think that's important too, that it's not just something happening here in the United States, it's happening all over the world and in all of the Americas. Um, as people you know, begin to see those transformations and, and adjust to them and also adapt them in their own practices. I can't see Scott's question, so. Oh, okay, I see it now. Um, 
I don't expect language to be stationary. Language is always evolving and moving and shifting. And as uh, more people, uh, more diverse people in the country come in contact, we also take on the words of other folks, of languages that other folks speak and it becomes a part of our lexicon. So, um, but in terms of gender, I think that gender is also specific to one's culture, how you identify what words you use um, and also politically. So yeah, it's, it, it's, it's definitely gonna be different depending on, and also even what region that you live in, in, in this country. There are a ton of questions in the chat and in the Q&A box. I don't know that we have time to respond to all of them. Um, there is one about Emily's terror. Um, wait, I, I see. lost it. Oh, yeah. And Erin, Erin's been upvoted twice. Maybe we should look at hers if we have time for one more. Yes. <laughs> so what do you do? Is that the one you're talking about? Yes, that's or, what I'm Okay. Thinking. Or how do you write when you are thinking of an ancestor or family past, but have very little access to what happened? Do you ever imagine your way into an ancestor's story? Yes. <laughs> um, I don't think it's the only thing to do, but I, I think um, that's usually the the initiating impulse when I don't have access to a story. I'm imagining what a fam what many family members might say. I'm, imag I'm remembering stories that got told about that person. I'm remembering what I disagree with and what I am agree with. And um, I do I, I love research too. I like to sort of write the imagined version and then go find out more. And that's oral history research, interviewing family members that are still here, checking my memory, um, uh, you know, writing something and and checking it. And I don't always change it if it if somebody disagrees with me, but I want to know where my my story stands in that family, the family lexicon of stories. Yeah, what do you what do you see, Leonora and Cynthia? What do you what about you? Yeah, same. I do imagine what their experience would be like, but I also, something that I like to do is I have conversations with my ancestors and those are totally imagined. So they're based on what I've heard from other family members, things that I've been told, things that I grew up with. But I do love the idea of being able to talk to your ancestor and mm. sometimes ask questions, even if those questions don't have an answer. The idea is just to to be with that person and to sort of imagine what their life would have been like um, if things had been different. Um, and I've done that a lot with my great grandmother who I did meet, but I didn't get to spend as much time with her as I would have wanted to. And I heard so many stories about her. And so um, I always talk to her um, at different times. All of the stories that are in my book are um, oral histories that my mother relayed to me. My mother told me all the stories about my grandmother and my great grandmother. And so I just made poems out of those. And and so that it's, it's similar to how I feel, you know, about for my mother's um, Betsy, Lucy, and Annika. I'm you know, it's my job to tell my ancestor stories, whether it's my direct ancestors or our um, collective ancestors. But um, I, I do have some family history that I can rely on to, to tell some of those stories. All right, so we have tons and tons of questions, but we don't have the time to answer all of them, unfortunately. Um, we do want to uh, give you some time to write, and we brought some prompts. Um, there is one prompt for each section that we discussed and talked about. Um, Elizabeth, would you mind sharing those in the 
chat. So you are getting a document from Elizabeth that you can download. This document, I just shared it in the chat. It's also available on the SCED app in attached to this program on the app. So it's in the chat and it's in the app as well. Leo, do you want to walk us through or should we each? Um, I'll I'll do a quick walk through um, so that we can give folks enough time to write. Yes, great. Um, because we are almost at time. <laughs> um, so the first prompt is for the language and history section, and it's based on the poem I read, Katsarida Phobia, which um, is the fear of cockroaches. And so um, it's a prompt. It's a prompt in several parts. You can do whichever part you feel comfortable with right now and you can do more later if you want so it's basically talking about what you are afraid of um, and you can do that by just telling yourself this is what I'm afraid of or you can also write a letter to yourself or to someone else explaining that um, and I, I want to keep it open in the sense that it doesn't have to be a poem if you want to write a prose piece you can do that too if you're a fiction or nonfiction writer the second poem uh, gen is for the gender and patriarchy section and is based on um, the poem T by Farnas. And basically um, it's asking you to, to use that poem as inspiration um, to talk about food items in your life or objects that carry more meaning than just what people can see. Um, they can have, you know, emotional, sentimental value. They can be related to family traditions, to um, things that remind you of others, loved ones who are not with you anymore. So um, I don't know, Farnas, if you wanna add anything to that. Um, no, I I think that it's, I, it's an example of, um, Carl Phillips it always says, you can take a prompt from any poem. You know, you just look at the poem carefully and you can create your, a prompt every day for yourself. And so that's what I did with this one is really to think, um, think about making a definition poem. But once you start writing definitions, you will take yourself somewhere different than this poem. And you, it might be a prose, it might prose poem. It might be, it might not look like definitions anymore. So it's meant to let you go to, um, to be open. Perfect. Um, and then Cynthia's poem for the family and migration section of our panel is an ekphrastic poem. Um, and she gives you the definition of ekphrasis and um, gives you a couple of links too, if you wanna look more into that later. Um, so ekphrasis is a, are poems or works written about works of art. Um, there is uh, an image that you um, can use for inspiration. And at the end of the document, there's a, a wonderful bibliography of black women poets that I recommend you check out and, um, and use. So um, we're gonna give you about 10 minutes um, and you don't have to write you know, a perfect thing. It's just a draft, an exercise to get you going, a little seed or uh, maybe later, and um, you have the, the document with you that so that you can keep and try any of the prompts at later times. And we were really hoping you'd just pick one right now and just mm -hmm. worry about one or enjoy one and yeah. not, and then, you, you know, yes, there's plenty of time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, happy writing.
folks, we have about a minute. So if you want to sort of finish what you are writing. All right, so um, we want to ask if you feel compelled to do so. Um, if there's anything you want to share, please put it in the chat and we'll try to read as much as we can. We only have about four minutes before time's up. Um, you don't have to share, it's totally optional. But if there's something that you're dying to share, even if it's a line or your process or something that you, know, you want to write about maybe later and that the poems inspired you to think about, Please do. Thank you, Kate. Kate says, thank you for your insights in this prompts. I struggled to write about fear, but your vulnerability, all three of you helped me approach it. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Oh goodness, I lost it. <laughs> Um, Kat G says, wow, I found a lot of meaning from my mom's hair and my hair from the crafted <laughs> prompt. Thank you. That's fabulous. Please bet about my fear of cockroaches. <laughs> yes, that is like universally shared. <laughs> wow. He pronoun, a male or man. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but full of self-righteous ego, seen as better by society, a bitter and painful memory that will always hold me. Mm. That's beautiful. Shelby Lynn, Shelby Lynn, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, this was our first lesson in pressure. Oh, I like that line. Lizbeth, the smell of sewage brings me back from a serene dream like a California jolt, customary and terrifying. <laughs> yes. Smell of incest. Oof. Mm. Wow. And Allison used the acrostic prompt. Maybe it would even be a relief to look back and not see what I've left behind, to pretend I am not braided into history, that I could cut myself out at any time. Oh, yeah, I love that. That is so visual, too. Yeah. Valerie, white freckled woman, mom ashamed of ancestors being criminal, dead or no connection to past. Ooh. Something to interrogate. Mm -hmm. Evelyn, endometriosis excerpt. Invisibly ferocious, how my room tries to grow all throughout me as if to build the home we never had to once again return to the warm, oh, sorry, warm darkness of a heartbeat. And that should be womb. Mm. Yes. Oh, thank you, Evelyn. Casey, I hope I'm pronouncing your name right. Pulling, pulling, I could only sit in fear, knowing this was my choice, but forever doubting if it was the right one. Oh, yay. <laughs> oh, yes. Fear, that's a big one. And mm -hmm. it's a, it takes so, so long to process, but it's totally worth it. Yeah, I'm doing that prompt many times. <laughs> Thank you, Leonora. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're I think we're all doing each other's prompts very soon. <laughs> mm. And just like feel free to, you know, do any part of the prompts that called to you. We hope that they're useful to you and that they inspire you to explore things that you want to unlearn maybe about yourself and about your history um so i think we are out of time 
But thank you everyone for being here and for, for joining us and for listening and for just like going with the flow. And I'm glad my connection is finally working. <laughs> <laughs> That was a great day. Yeah. Thank you so much, Leonora. Um, on behalf of the museum, I want to extend a tremendous thank you to you, to Farnes, and to Cynthia for sharing your histories and yourselves and leading us to an intersection of language and history and identity whose branches will continue to follow throughout the festival. And thank you to everyone in the audience for doing the work of listening and for those people who are so brave um, to share their words with us tonight. So we will be bringing you more poetry programming this week through Sunday the 25th online and in person. The full schedule and the information can be found online on the festival platform. Though it's not too late to sign up for more programs like the Emily Dickinson Poetry Marathon, tomorrow's Wild Nights Writing the Queer Love Poem, Saturday's Headliner Reading, and a lot more. So to sign up for more programs, we're going to put the link to the festival platform, Sked, in the chat. And then, as you know, this is a free festival, but it cannot be produced without the generosity of our participants. So if you have not, and you are able to do so, please consider making a donation in support of our, of our events. We'll put that donation in the chat right now. And we also, oh, we promised that we would send more of that speaker information and put that in the chat. So hold on one second. We're going to do this too, because I know some of you really want to check out the work of these great poets and um, didn't get to catch those links at the beginning. So I'm going to start with Cynthia, uh, Leonora. Someone's asking if there's a way to save the chat. Is that not possible? There is a way for you to save the chat. You need to go to the little dots where you see um, type message here. There's two little dots and then scroll up and click save chat and that'll save it on your computer for you. And I'm just gonna put, now it says information in. Oh, that's, that, I think that is what they're. Oh, it's not available for the audience. Okay. Well, all of this information is actually on SCED on each of their, their profiles. Um, if it isn't, we'll make sure that it is. But it should be there along with the prompts. And we do have to bid you good evening. Um, but you can always check that or also write EDM programs at emilydickinsonmuseum.org and we'll make sure you get everything you need. Thank you so much. We're looking forward to spending this week with you. Uh, take care. <laughs>